education in India is basically a very unjust um, situation because you have two kinds of schools. You have English medium schools which give a very good education and which guarantee almost a good job. Uh, but they are not supported by the government. Uh, they are highly priced all right, but they are very highly priced as well. So people who can send their children to the, uh, these English medium schools are in a vicious cycle of affluence. If they can afford to pay the fees, their kids can come to the school and the cycle repeats itself, their children will get good jobs and so on. On the other hand, those who can't afford this and send their children to a vernacular school, some vernacular schools are very good. In fact, all considering the kind of clientele that come to them and the numbers are doing very well. But there you will be sharing your teacher with 150 other kids. So in such a situation where you have 120 to 150 kids in a class, uh, such children are really trapped into a vicious cycle of poverty. But they can't afford the fees for a good school and they go to the vernacular schools. In addition to that, in many cases, those who don't go to the school at all, because they don't feel they may learn anything, are put in as child labour. So these are the two situations we have in India. Now we as Loretta sisters have no justification to be here in India uh, running a very big English medium school for well-off children who can afford to pay fees and ignoring all the poverty and the misery of children all around who are blocked out from the system. So in order to try to equalize things, I set out here in this school to uh, cater to 50% of the poorest. So roughly we have 1,400 kids in the school, 50% coming from the slums, 50% coming from the well-off backgrounds. And in this way, we as Loretta sisters in all our schools all over India are trying to equalize this situation and if possible, help the children to break out from that vicious cycle of poverty. Because that's basically, they're trapped into that and it's very difficult to break out of it without some outside help. Then in addition to that, we have set ourselves in the school given ourselves a mandate to be a resource centre for the poorest. All our big English medium schools all over India have this capacity. We have so much power, we have so many resources, we have so much that we can do. We have two choices. We can run an extremely good English medium school where very well off children come. They will get good values, they will get a good exposure, they will have a good education, but they will not do anything to change the system afterwards because they are the beneficiaries of the system. Whereas if you bring in the other children, hopefully they will do something to change. Uh, however, when you bring very poor children into a very well-off system, you run the risk that they will acquire the values of the well-off and move out from the school equally uh, desirous of their own future and not bothering too much about the rest of the country and what's happening. So for that reason, therefore, we have also a series of other programs. We have a compulsory program just as maths and English and other subjects are made compulsory, we have a compulsory program of compassion. Compassion with hands-on experience. Our children, first of all, have two periods per week of work, work education in their timetable, and during that time, they are sent up to the roof to teach the rainbow children. The rainbow children are the children coming off the streets. They're a, a step down from the children living in the slums. Those in the slums, at least, they have four walls, they may be made of a bit of cardboard or rexine or um, tarpaulin or whatever, but there are four walls around them. They have two parents, mother and father, who live together amiably, and they are able to come to school, strangely enough, even out of such dreadful situations, they are able to come clean to school. The street children live totally irregular lives. They will not be able to come to school every day at the right time because they've got some work. They will not be able to keep uniforms, not be able to do homework. They can't do any of those things that the regular child can do in school. And for that reason, therefore, we have created a special school because for them school is not an option. But we have created here a special program whereby any time throughout the day they can drop in through our gate and our gates are always open. Uh, they drop in through our gate and they will find 50 girls free and ready to teach them whenever they come. And we do this by the simple expedient of directing our socially useful productive work periods or work education as they're called, two periods per week per child from class five upwards. So placed end to end throughout the day, you have a reservoir of 50 potential teachers free and ready to teach whoever comes. And in that way, the regular children, whether they're from well off or from poor homes, they have an exposure to the street children, they listen to them, they hear them, they teach them, they sympathize with them. So in that way, they have 
The rainbow children initially were day scholars and then I found some of them being molested on the street and so on and I looked around and I see our buildings free every day from two or three every afternoon to eight the next morning and this is true for all big English medium schools all big schools, government, everybody schools empty out and all that space is wasted so I said why not bring these children who are at great risk on the street let them live in our schools and now in this school we have 247 children living in and um, in Loretto Bow Bazaar another 200 and Loretto uh, Durham Tullet 50, Elliot Road has got uh, 27, they'll soon now have 4 to 40, and Loretto House about 180. So all together, and then we also have Bans Roney, which is a Providence convent, so all together we would have about nearly 800 children off the streets. And we're trying to spread this concept of every single principle of every single big school were to open up their gates, we could solve these problems of street children and children without schools. The lab which you see here over here, it's a lab set up for the rainbow students and the street children who come here to learn computers. Basically this is a very unique program which has been set up as a part of the rainbow program only and uh, we have been teaching the rainbow kids for last two years now. The rainbow children who goes to school in many different places, they come over here in the morning and in the afternoon before they go out to the school or they come back after the school for their computer classes. They are here for at least thrice a week and at least three hours per week. We began to have a, a mother's meeting where we, the mothers come in or any significant adults belonging to the children. Two to three they talk and have a chat. Three to four then we have a business hour and then after that the children serve them some tea and snacks and then chat with them till about six. So during that business hour we discovered that many of them were in the hands of money lenders here in Poli Market. That they would buy, um, borrow money, buy a few vegetables, try to resell them and all the profit went back to the money lenders. So that was when we first decided to start the microcredit and we found that it worked so well with these mothers, the street mothers. And we have one lady, Aklima, who is a very, very excellent manager. She manages the whole program now and she collects back the money and so on and it has been running very well. We also are not satisfied only to reach the children from the streets. We also go out into the rural areas. Every Thursday, which is our school holiday, 150 children move out into the village schools uh, where they would handle about 3,000 village children on this program. And they divide them up into small groups. Now these are children who are in that vicious cycle of poverty that I referred to, where you have 120 children to a teacher. So throughout the week they get very little personal attention. So at least on the Thursday they, there's one of our children to 15 of them so they can give them some personal attention. And they do science, practical science with them, they do games, they do language development, all the different aspects. They have a special program called the CLE where they teach them English and anything which is going to be an advantage to the children. So the whole school from class 5 up to class 12 gives one Thursday per month. But for each Thursday, about one quarter of the school goes out. So that's the village program. Then we have another one also where our children are very deeply involved, and that's in the um, hidden domestic child labor. Uh, this is where now you have children who are born into families who can't afford to keep them, or who feed them or clothe them. They farm them out to another family, which agrees to pay 200 rupees, which is about four euros or six dollars or whatever a month and in return these children get, are supposed to be fed and clothed but in fact they get very little and they are virtually used as slaves even 10 or 12 hours a day so our children who know where they live if, if a normal person goes if an adult goes to inquire they'll be told oh she's only up on a visit from the village but our children who live next door know that they're not up on a visit and they are instructed they go to the uh, lady of the house and they say madam if it's a boy little girl living here please allow them out once a week to play with us we're uh, making a club for children of the neighborhood and they get them out and they find out what their problems are their difficulties they want to write to their parents and so on and in that way our children get very much involved then they go back and they harass the parents the uh, employers please allow them to go to school they are all out of school children Either they are dropouts from class 1 to 5 or they have never been to school. There are some children who have never been to school. So, majority of them are girls. They are the eldest in the family, looking, uh, say, the breadwinner of the family. 
Then it was decided that we uh, open drop-in centers. Drop-in centers is, is a contact point where the child comes in for recreation and for a lot of uh, say mixing with other children. So far at present now we have 10 drop-in centers running for 2 hours a, uh, a day, every day, 5 days a week and so far we have uh, uh, enrolled uh, 411 child domestic workers in our drop-in centers. So these children now they, they also uh, are prepared in the drop-in center to be put into the school with the consent of employers. And that brings us on to our next program which is our Shikalaya Prokalpo where we have 470 centers all over the city in the slums catering to children who have no schools to go to. These are what we call hard to reach children and this comes under the government as Shava Shiksha Abiyan, which uh, pays for the teachers the princely sum of 1800 a month. What you see behind me is a very informal Shikalaya Prokolpo Centre. Initially, before we had any concrete or pakka structure, so to say, all classes were held either on the doorstep or on the veranda of some, uh, you know, well-wishers home or, as you can see, under a tree. Hammer, Bolun. Starting from giving the training to the teachers, then monitoring the centers, 476 centers, then evaluating the children and giving them all the materials. The children don't have to bring anything to the centers. Then they don't have to pay anything for the for their study. We provide all the study materials, starting from pencil, rubber, till bag. They are getting cooked food every day, Monday to Friday, with their education system. And then they, they give the supplies and everything. So we do all the training of those teachers. So we have a huge training program going on for about 800, 800 such teachers. So at the moment we have 470 centers all over the city and we have about 30,000 children into school. Every year, more than 1,000 children get mainstream to the government school from this slum centers. That particular program grew out of an earlier program which I had started way back in 88 which we call the barefoot teacher training and the, in this training uh, we see all the theory which is normally given in a training college as the shoe which is not really necessary. What is necessary are the feet so we see our intensely practical training which we give by getting these people to come in from remote villages or remote slums and they sit in on our teachers, teachers uh, train them up in various methods, share all their methodologies, share all their work cards, everything with them, and turn them, amazingly, within even a week or a fortnight, we can turn out people who are really able to teach. And it's amazing how much they pick up. It's also amazing even among the um, Shikalaya Prokalpo teachers, how much they pick up just by being in this ambience, seeing how our teachers teach, seeing the dedication with which they teach, all these are values which normally people don't get in an ordinary training college. It's, this is an exposure, if you like. It's a completely different vision of what can be done through these programs. And the barefoot teacher training, if I was to go back and count up, we've been doing this since 1988. So it's a long time that's almost 20, 20 years. And in that 20 years, I think we must have trained thousands and thousands of teachers. And they have impacted the lives of many more thousands of children. Recently, we got very much involved with um, the Eastern Bypass. I was very concerned about the fact that large numbers of children were coming onto the streets. It's like a hemorrhage. So we said, let's go out and see what's out there, where they're coming from, any way we can stop them. So we went out to the Eastern Bypass, and there we found thousands of families perched between a fast-running electric train on one side and a deep drop into water. Uh, no sanitation, no electricity, no drinking water, nothing. We said to them, what do you want? We are, we are concerned for you. And the only thing they asked for, they said, give us a school. So I said, have you anyone we can train? So they said, yeah, we they gave us six people, four girls and two boys, passed up to the second year of secondary school and then dropped out through poverty. So we took them and in our teacher training, we trained them up. And we also put in a module, Teresa added an extra social work module. And the boys used our module of survey and so on and ranged down the length of the railway tracks. And the girls took a hundred children from that area, 
He began to teach them in the morning, play with them in the afternoon, and do adult literacy with the mothers in the evening. Bagajidin rail kuni dusho yon poribar ache. Poribar e amra sarve kori, sarve kore, sarve reporta amra mane loyalty days kule di diichi. Ekhane theke reporta ni, ora ekhane theke amader teni niyechi. Chajjon moila mu dujon kurus. Say by last September. The adult literacy had been so successful that we were able to start the micro-credit scheme with them. We have Akrima Bibi, a field worker who is loan collector. We have given money for these people to start their own business. In the year uh, 2008, we have given an amount of 3,25,000 and 90% of the repayment we have received. We also have medical camp in these areas and uh, awareness program. We now have 10 schools started down along, about 1,500 children into school, and we're planning now another five schools, which will bring the number up to about 2,000 children in that area will come into school. Then another area where we also reached, have reached out recently is the brick fields. The brick fields are on the western side, a huge, huge numbers, and as far as we know, we don't think anybody has ever actually started schools inside the brick field yards. But to our amazement when we went out, we found the 26 brickfield owners agreed to have the schools inside in, our, in their brickfield yards. Approximately 120 brickfields were surveyed and we found that on an average 65 children are living in each brickfield. Now these are the children of migrant workers and they don't speak Bangla. So if the government here allow the children to be admitted in the schools, it will be no good for them. Thus, we sort of came with an idea, so let's bring the school to the children. We decide to open schools inside Brickfields. And so the children now are, will be able to get their schooling. At the same time, of course, many of them will continue to work because they're badly paid. But at least the beginnings have been made. We can't go in immediately and start talking about don't employ child labor. Because, you know, people will reject immediately and then you're cut out altogether. आज बच्चे जो नहाते नहीं थे, बोलने का ढंग सही तरीके से नहीं था, अपना हेयर उन लोग कभी सफा नहीं करते थे। आज देखने को उन लोगों के अंदर बहुत बदलाव आ गया है। तो उम्मीद है भविष्यत में और ज़्यादा बदलाव आना चाहिए। And he opened around 20 schools, and five in South Chobish Parguna, five in Hooghly, and ten in Howrah. And around 1150 children are studying in these schools. 38 teachers are involved in this project. Two other groups that we have got involved with. One are the Sunlap group. Now Sunlap is an organization, an excellent organization. It brings back the children from the trafficked areas. See, education is important, but many of these children did not, uh, it did not happen to them. Uh, their families did not uh, think about it. They, did, they themselves, you know, they did not think about it. Many of these girls ran away or were given in marriage when they were very young and then they were trafficked into prostitution or they were in, uh, even in uh, brothel prostitution. You know, they're picked up by police and then, but when they come back, the parents don't want them, the families don't want them and the police don't want them to go back because they say they'll be recycled, re-trafficked. So these are girls who are locked up in Shanlap in, in a very protected environment. And we got involved in this because the chief, uh, the chief secretary of West Bengal told them to come to me for advice about education. Anyway, the end of, of it is that they now have about 25 children, girls from that um, red light, I mean trafficked background. They're now coming into regular school, attending our regular classes with the intention of being prepared for open school. These girls, when they come to us, they are generally between 13, 14, 15, that's the age group we get. And that is the time, you know, they start going to school. So, open school was the only answer uh, for our girls and we consulted the uh, successor And hopefully we will have maybe 10 or 12 of them next year. We will try for their open school and get through. And they'll come back and they'll do class 12. Now they have their uniform and they have their, you know, uh, shoes and bags and water bottle and throughout the day they are there going in a bus, coming back in a bus and it adds to their self-confidence which adds to you know they are doing well. So we are really very grateful and the other area was the red light area where Terra de Zom began working with the red light people to try and stop this trafficking also and uh, as part of that they found out that the children were not being sent to school. 
so uh, because they were being um, discriminated against in their own areas they were being um, you know told oh you prosecute children you sit separately don't come here and so on so nobody wanted to go to school so they said can you help us I said yes all you do is shove them in our gate at 8 o'clock every morning and we will send them out from here relabeled or at a rainbow children they don't have prostitute written on their foreheads. so we have done that now as a result of that the Terra des Hommes bought us three lovely big yellow buses and so that we could bus the children in every morning and take them back in the evening and um, the best of it all was that they made us owners of the buses so the buses belonged to us and they gave me some money to help to run them now our most recent situation is that the Terra des Hommes are pulling out they are not going to continue with the anti-trafficking program so they're also pulling out from the schooling they won't support the schooling anymore but I have written to the people, the red light people, to say um, we will continue. We will send the buses for your children and we will bring your children into school and we will keep them. And as they grow up, the girls, as they get older and become interesting to the clients of the red light areas, then they can come in as boarders. Still, uh, this school seems to cater to every possible group, <laughs> but there's another group of old people. Now these are very pathetic because they're abandoned on the side of the street all around the station and they're told by their families, we'll come back for you. So they sit there, chained by love, to that little spot where they are, terrified to move in case by chance the family comes and they lose the connection. And if someone throws them a little bit of food, well and good, otherwise they just slowly starve to death. So our children go out every day around one o'clock. The children have just come in off the street, our little rainbows, not yet put into school, but just preparing. They go back out and they take with them 42 lunches and they serve those lunches to these poor people, sit down with them, chat with them like they talk to their grannies. And in this way, in a way, the cycle is complete because these children have come from the streets themselves. Now they go back to help older people who are in very great need. And then we have two homes outside of Calcutta. Here we try to invite these old people to come. It's very difficult to persuade them because they would prefer, they're always terrified, as I say, that their family will come and they lose the connection, but the family never comes. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that schools are taking up this challenge and especially Loretta Sialda is a pioneer to take up such a project. We have old age homes and there are, for social work maybe children are visiting old people once in a year or twice in a year. But to get on a first hand experience by going out to the station, feeding them, caring them, talking to them and sharing their lives is something that is very unique in Loretta Sialda. Now regarding the normal school, the regular school which is really the core of this entire enterprise. Uh, that regular school as we've said already have 50% children from the slums and 50% from well-off families. But all are chosen on a lottery system so there's no academic entrance test. So unlike in many schools where the academic entrance test will obviously favor the well-off child who's had a tutor to prepare her uh, whereas the poor child will appear very very poor a very low academic standard. Here everybody comes in on the same um, gamble, if you like, on the same lottery. So we get a wide range of abilities, even among our well-off children. We haven't creamed off the best brain. However, I often say to people here in Calcutta, it's amazing that since we take our children by lottery and we don't cream off the best brain, that our results are roughly comparable to everybody else in the city. We have had only one failure in my 30 years in this school. Otherwise, everybody gets through, majority, more than 50% with first class, about maybe 35-40% with second class and just a few stragglers in third class. Now we have special children who would be mentally handicapped, Down syndrome and so on. Now they have their own special teacher, but they are all of them uh, um, related into a class, a regular normal uh, class. What happens with these children is they go for an hour to their special teacher and she checks them and sets them up for the day and then they go off with all their work up to their regular class and they belong to a group and all our teaching in all our classes is done in groups so which facilitates learning much more, much more than in straight lines so the group that they belong to then helps them with their lessons and sees that they do it while they go on with their own studies as well among these children also apart from the mentally handicapped kids we also have children who get pushed out from other schools many many schools in spite of all my efforts as Secretary for Education for the Archdiocese to prevent this, children get pushed out of school if they fail twice. Even if they fail, even if it's not in the same class. 
but once they fail twice they're out. And the principals who push them out never ask, where will this child go? So in other words, some other school should take charge of, of the, our failures. Now I believe that if we have failures in our school, we are responsible. So therefore we keep our own failures and we provide uh, remedial work or remedial classes or whatever is necessary to encourage them and to get them on. We also have an open school section where they can move over if they don't want to do maths and things like that and where they can take the exam at their own pace. But in addition to that, we also receive a lot of rejects, if you like, from other schools. Failures. I have got 26 students in my class. Many of them have joined in the class this year itself. They are mostly students who are coming from schools outside uh, our school and most of them have done very badly. They have failed twice or thrice and their schools do not want to keep them anymore. And the children are about 12, 13, 14 years of age and they cannot be slotted to any particular class because of their age right now. So we have put them all together into this class where I am trying to give them a consolidated knowledge so that they can prepare themselves for the open school exams. Now they have come into Loretta Shialda, they are a part of the school, they are participating in all the other activities and they have become like other normal kids. And they are doing well now, they are getting good marks and that gives them that extra enthusiasm to work even better. So this value education and this human rights, this is also part of our whole ethos in the school. And our children are learning their values not by what we teach them and preach to them, but by what they actually practice. See, they see things like equality in the school. They see even the very poorest people are invited into the office. They see the gate wide open, anybody come in, anybody can have access to me, to the teachers. Um, they, they themselves are going out into the villages, they are talking to street children, and all on a basis of equality. They're brought up on the realization that our constitution in India guarantees equality to everybody. The program on human rights education was initiated in uh, 2006. Uh, it is a three-phase module. Module 1, which deals with the introduction of human rights education, is to be done with class 6. Module 2 deals with child rights, is to be done with class 7. And module 3 deals with discrimination, which is supposed to be done with class 8. So you cannot discriminate between one and the other. And you may not make judgments on people because of clothes or because of any of those other external factors, and even internal factors either. All are equal. Similarly, even our bearers and our uh, domestic staff, our support staff, they all wear the same uniform. All of our people, whether they're sweepers or whoever they are, have to cut up vegetables in the morning. So these are ways by which we propagate values of equality. And freedom, the children are very free because there's no oppressive rules for them to keep. And everything is reasonable. We reason everything out with them. We uh, employ logic rather than force, if you like. So they know if there's a rule, the reason why the rule is being made, and hopefully, mostly they cooperate and do it. So our value systems, love, sincerity, justice, and freedom. The child who is loved has the uh, capacity to be sincere, has the courage to be sincere, and um, also becomes free because she knows she's loved, she knows she's cared for, and then she can be just to other people, she can be fair. This is a very important aspect of our whole setup. JPIC stands for Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation. We take up different issues which are linked with the Millennium Goals. Education is the, really the answer to everything, but it has to be a different kind of education. Not the education where the children are just brought in, sat down with their books, and trained to get the highest possible uh, result and the highest possible degree and off to America or England on a scholarship and never come back. That, that is not what I hope for. What I hope for is that by this kind of education which we give them, where we are exposing them to real issues, it's not just simply that they're running out to the villages. Yes, they're going out to the villages every, every week. But we are also, through our value education and our um, ju social justice, and our human rights education, we are getting them to reflect on that experience. So when we talk about social justice and we talk about rights, we have an experience on the part of the children to relate that to. It's not a sterile lecture in a, in a, a two-dimensional classroom. It's something that they have actually lived through. When they've gone up and they've listened to a child up on the, on the rainbow program who has possibly been raped, 
That makes an awful lot of difference. When they talk to these traffic girls from Shanlap and we ask them to share what, for me, what does being a girl mean? Uh, they're listening to the stories. They're getting a whole huge dimension vision of life which they would never get in a normal school. So this kind of education, and it has to be an education which is woven into the regular school. It's not some, something separate. It's a part of the entire lot, everything. People sometimes look at us and say, oh, very good social work. This is not social work. This is education. It's education for the future, education to, um, for social transformation. And we won't uh, transform the world by telling the children what to do. It's by giving them this hands-on uh, sort of acceptance and this hands-on experience that then they become, they be really become, uh, what should I say, initiators of change in their own areas. All around me are all ex-students come back to the school as teachers. And I've got many of them. Many of our people who have come through the school now have come back to work with me as teachers and as um, helpers in various, in various support situations. Now, how does all this get carried along? We look for sponsorships. Uh, some people locally give us sponsorships, the Hong Kong Bank, for example. I am personally a great fan of uh, Sister Cyril and the wonderful work she does. I'm not the only one. There are countless number of people in West Bengal who have benefited from the good work she does. Uh, this is something which has been recognized widely by the nation also, by a very grateful nation, which has given her the Padma Shri Award, a very well-deserved Padma Shri. HSBC as a professional organization does not just go on the basis of personal uh, admiration or feelings. It also has to ensure that whatever support we provide translates into the required benefit for the people it is intended for. In this case, children from underprivileged backgrounds, children from slums, and uh, children from the street. And that is what we have seen happening in a very effective manner. And then um, people like, for example, say we had a little Sabu who had a hole in our heart. And we, as Teresa approached uh, Dr. Colonel Sarkar in the um, Rabindranath Tagore Hospital, and they carried out that operation free. And he like had a hole in the heart, which uh, would uh, be a very incapacitating thing for her to have for the rest of her life. Uh, we fixed this hole in her heart and it's been a gift of life, not from us, but from Sister Cyril and her colleagues in the Vector Sianda, because if not for them, uh, these uh, people who are not as well off as most of the others are would have never seen the light of day in terms of getting uh, expensive tertiary heart treatment. So each one of these is ways by which slowly, slowly we collect money and we utilize it. And not only do we support all the stuff that's happening here, we also have um, our small village schools in Panigata, Loreto, uh, up in uh, Saddam, away in Lole, out here in Takapuka, where the children are too poor to be able to pay fees. I have children here who will not have a birthday uh, party, well-off children, whose parents will come in to me and say, she doesn't want a birthday party, she wants the money to go for the poor children. Then you have at Christmas, we, have the, we give out about 1,500 parcels to the very poorest children. The junior school teachers get the uh, parents um, to donate back the little the clothes because little children grow very fast so they get all the donations back from the parents then we take back all the books and the well-off children all donate their books back and that becomes a book bank where other children can borrow there are well-wishers all over the world in fact say for example there's a death in the family and they inform everybody please don't send flowers give us the money and we will put it to a good cause in India in that way many many uh, money comes from all, all over and I can give this assurance to anybody who's listening and who's wondering whether they should go into this kind of work that there will be no dearth of money. The money will come. God provides. And I firmly believe, I have a very firm belief that if we try to do something good, God will definitely look after us. I began by just admitting 50% um, of the poorest children into the school. 
Uh, there was no, I, I waited for any objections from other parents who were paying fees. No objections came. Then slowly we decided to do something for the, we began to go out into the villages. Sometimes a few of the parents came out in their cars to see where we were going and I encouraged that. And wherever I tried to bring in something new, I would have parent-teacher meetings and we would talk about these programs. Like for example, inviting them in and saying, now what do you want most for your child from the school? And then writing up on the board, you know, um, patriotism and love of country and service, a good career, all those things. So I wrote them all up on the board and then I said, now, like um, patriotism, now the village program will give your child that. Central service, the rainbow program will give the child that. Good career or academic program will give that. And we keep our academic program very high. We also never, never sacrifice academics to any other curricular activities. We sacrifice leisure time. So the children learn that you do your duty, but you also, this is part of your duty, and you give up your time to it. You make some sacrifices. It's not enough just simply to, that you can just uh, um, do whatever you like as, as and when. But it's something that you really make a sacrifice for. And in that way, hopefully we build children with a bit of moral strength in them. You know, that they can stand up for what they believe to be right later on in society. So it's not a brand new idea that we bring here. It's more that we have developed it up to the point where we're looking at real development now. It's not just simply charity giving handouts. It's where we are really helping people to stand on their own feet and solve their own problems. And my real dream for India is that we will reach a point where every child will have enough food so they're not brain damaged and a really quality education so that they can reach their very, very best potential. And if every child in India was to reach our highest potential, we have the best gene bank in the world. We have the most clever children and the most clever people. And India would, you know, they talk about India shining. India is not shining. But if every single child gets to school and every child gets enough food, India will really be shining in the future.